Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar, Idea to Algorithm, the full workflow behind developing a quantitative trading strategy. Today's speaker is Delaney McKenzie. Delaney's background is in computer science, statistics, math, and computational genetics. As director of academia at Quantopian, he oversees the firm's worldwide educational and academic initiatives. While working with professors at schools including Princeton, MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, Delaney developed the free online Quantopian lecture series. The lecture series draws from academic rigor and industry realism and has since spawned a global workshop program teaching quantitative finance. Delaney currently focuses on maintaining the quality of the lectures as they grow, while also growing the audience of people who have learned from the lectures. He graduated from Princeton with a degree in computer science. So thanks, Delaney. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and I just wanted to look, give a little bit of context on like what type of stuff I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so specifically, the idea here is to kind of recap and really try to go, what's the actual full workflow that a quant is going to generally be following when they're trying to construct, construct a, a trading strategy? Because um, it's been a while now and Quantopian has added, you know, quite a few different tools and there's been a lot of uh, specific focus on different parts of that workflow. And I think um, something that's probably going to be helpful, uh, especially to people who have been kind of deep diving in some of the new stuff, is just to come back up to the surface and say, okay, like, what, like, let's put it in big picture. Let's put it in context. Um, and I don't know if any of you were at uh, QuantCon in New York, but I gave a talk at QuantCon in New York, which was getting at some similar stuff of really talking about um, kind of what's the quant workflow and what are the steps and uh, talking about this notion of like iterative hypothesis development. And I, I'm going to refer back to some elements of that talk today, but I'm also going to try to frame it within um, what I think now is actually a pretty complete set of tools on Quantopian that allow you to really get at a lot of different parts of that workflow. So the first thing I want to talk about is what's the first step in a, in, in, you know, a workflow? Like what, what is the process of quantitative finance? What is the process of developing strategies? Why do you want to do it? And at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take an idea, you're trying to take thought, and you're trying to turn it into dollars. And that's, in most jobs, what you're trying to do at the end of the day is take thought and turn it into dollars. Um, but this one, obviously, you know, it has some specifics that I think are useful to go over. So um, I'm going to show this picture, which is a plot that I showed at the talk that I gave at um, QuantCon. And I think it's useful to kind of refer to when thinking about this. So the first step in anything is you're going to develop an economic hypothesis. And what do I mean when I say hypothesis? Uh, what I mean by that is you're coming up with an idea for how the world works. And this is important. And I think that it bears some kind of thought because this is very similar to what happens in physics and in science in that the whole point of quantitative finance is you're making bets, right? That's in fact the whole point of finance in general, you're making bets and you're betting on a future. And what science is trying to do is it's trying to understand the universe. And when you understand the universe, you can make intelligent decisions about the future. Because in fact, every decision we make is making a bet on the future. That's a point that I make a lot, which I think is important to internalize. Like everything we do is making a bet on the future. If you decide that you want to go out and get a certain type of food from a restaurant tonight, you are making many bets right now. You're making a bet that that restaurant will still be there. You're making a bet that you will still like that type of food. You're making a bet that you will still be hungry at that point in time. So there's a lot of bets that are under kind of underlying even a simple decision. And the other point is that you, you know, like it's, it's trite to say this, but you know, you, you can only change the future, right? You're sitting in the present, you have information about the past and you need to use that information to in some way um, make an intelligent bet about the state of the future. And uh, 
you know, the past is only useful insofar as it can help you understand the future. And so that's why these notions of stationarity are so important in many fields of statistics, because a lot of times these bets uh, kind of rely on implicit stationarity. They rely on implicit the world kind of continuing to be the same. So, you know, we're, we're betting on implicit stationarity of the force of gravity, right? We're saying that the force of gravity is not going to change over time. It is stationary at every point in time. Gravity is going to have the same downwards acceleration towards the center of mass. Um, similarly, in the example I gave, we're saying that my tastes for a certain type of food are not going to change over time. That actually might not be a great bet to make, right? That might be a little bit more volatile. So the reason that I'm kind of waxing a bit poetic here is because I think it's really important whenever you're doing quantitative finance to come at it from that very scientific perspective and let that drive everything else. So when you're saying you're developing an economic hypothesis, what you're really doing is you're saying, I believe that the world works this way, or I believe that this model should describe the behavior of this system, right? You're, you're, you're hypothesizing about what is true. And another quick point that I want to make here is that when you're hypothesizing about what is true, um, the things that are going to be the most interesting uh, are things that do not agree with your hypothesis. And so we'll get that into that in a second. But that's really the first step in the workflow. And just to quickly give you an overview, and then we're going to dive a little deeper into some of these different steps. Um, the first step in the workflow is you're going to come up with an idea. You're going to come up with a hypothesis, and that hypothesis is going to drive everything else. And so I'm going to quickly go through this full workflow diagram here. So the first step is you come up with a hypothesis, and then you explore that hypothesis. Hi hypothesis. I'm going to stop being able to say hypothesis if I say it 60 times. But you explore that idea. Um, and that's usually done in in-sample data, and we'll go into that a bit more in a bit. But so you explore the idea and you say like, does this idea make sense? Does it initially match with what I'm seeing? And usually that gives you information about how you can refine your hypothesis. And then a very, very important point that I wanna make, and I'll dig into this in a bit, is that hypotheses don't exist in isolation. So you have to compare it with what else exists. An analogy I like to use for this is when someone says, you know, what is a good sharp ratio or like how good does a model have to be for it to be useful to me and you know my answer to that is like you know if i showed you a car and said you know what is the price of this car how much is this car worth well your answer should be what is it priced at the other dealerships nearby right it like things never exist in isolation everything is relative so once you have a model that you think works one of the first steps is actually to compare it with other existing models and that actually gets into the notion of risk which is something that quantopian recently um, made some big pushes on in the terms of the risk model so we'll get into that a little bit later but then once you've determined that your new model has value then you say okay how does it fit into this like set of models that I might want to use to make predictions. Another important thing that I'll talk about a bit more later is that models are rarely good enough on their own. Usually you need compound models, models that have many underlying um, sub models that are making predictions. These are, um, you know, known as uh, kind of like expert uh, weighting techniques or expert voting techniques or um, aggregate models. There's lots of names for this kind of technique, but in general, in um, statistics and in finance and other modeling fields, uh, one of the best approaches to get good predictions is that of, uh, you know, combining many sub predictions into one overall prediction. And one of the best ways you can do that is just averaging the predictions together. And the reason that that works is because if your predictions are coming from independent sources, so if you have many models that are independent, you can think about it as each model is just a different lens. Think about it geometrically. What does it mean for, in geometry, two things to be independent? It means that they're orthogonal, right? They're at 90 degree angles. They don't intersect with each other. So if models are independent, you're getting new information because every new model you add is kind of a new view onto the system that you're trying to model. It's a new perspective, and as such, you're going to get more information out of it. So um, by combining more and more of them, you're just going to get a better view into the world. And uh, that better view is going to allow you to make better decisions overall. So there's an interesting loop here because Oftentimes what you'll do is you'll come up with a new idea, you'll explore it, you'll refine it, you'll compare it to existing things, you'll say, okay, how does my model fit within my existing set of models that, you know, like, do I want to weight it highly? Do I want to weight it low? Do I want to weight them all equally, et cetera? And then you go back and you say, okay, now with this new aggregate model, let's explore that, let's refine that, you know, and you kind of keep looping through and deciding how you should weight models, et cetera. 
And then once you think that you have a model that really works, then the next step is you're going to get new data and you're going to out of sample test it. This is incredibly important. It's, it's simple. You just, you know, test your model and new data that it hasn't seen before. Um, but it, it's incredibly important because it helps uh, make sure that you're not overfit to the time period that you're developing on. And then a point that I want to make is at no point yet have we done any kind of back testing, right? So this notion of back testing a full strategy, um, I think it's actually really overused. And uh, the reason behind that is because most of the time what you're doing is you're actually developing models, right? You're developing predictors. You're developing things that are predicting how the world will work. And that is done in a much more kind of like hands-on, in-depth way. And you're not actually doing any kind of portfolio construction. You are doing correlations between model predictions and future returns, which I'll show you a bit in Alpha Lens. Um, and we're going to go through and, and, and show like real hands-on examples for different components of this workflow, by the way. Um, but at no point here have we back tested anything. And then only now after we've determined, yes, our model is most likely good, it's been refined and it survives out of sample testing, we're pretty confident that our model predicts the future in some way, right? And so then the next step is, okay, if our model predicts the future in some way, how do we actually construct a portfolio of bets that actually will make money if we are right? And that's a key component here, right? This notion of portfolio construction. And then once we've constructed a portfolio, you know, then the next question is how do we actually execute that portfolio? How do we trade in and out of it? Which I think is an important question that a lot of people don't, you know, pay a ton of attention to, especially when they're getting into, um, into uh, finance. And, you know, whereas, for instance, on Quantopian, we handle a lot of the trading uh, part of things. We don't really let users worry too much about the execution. Um, at the same time, it's important to understand because if you have a model that is really good, but it requires that you be trading in and out of stuff really fast, well, at the end of the day, you're going to be paying so much in transaction fees that it's not really that great. And then the next step is, okay, once you've constructed that portfolio, you're actually going to do the back testing. And what's the purpose of back testing here? The purpose of back testing is not to check if your model is still correct, right? The purpose of back testing is that you want to know if your portfolio survives real market conditions. And I think that's a really important thing here. Um, you're not checking if your model is making good predictions. You're, you're checking to see if the portfolio that you design based on your model's predictions can survive real world things like transaction costs and liquidity and all sorts of stuff like that. And then once you kind of have made sure through a couple loops of back testing your portfolio, maybe you iterate in your portfolio a little bit, then usually you'll do one last check. And sometimes you can skip the out of sample test if you're gonna do an out of sample test here or whatever. Um, but you'll usually do one last check and you'll say, okay, now let's actually like, you know, paper trade or trade this on a small amount of capital for a little bit um, just to make sure that everything's still working. And then and only then would you actually deploy the model live and start scaling up the capital amounts and trying to make money. But so there's this whole workflow that occurs. And um, I wanted to dig into a few different parts of this because I think there's some important points here um, that need to be made. And uh, the other thing that I'm going to do quickly here is I'm going to try to um, write out and uh, let me know if you can see my screen here. I'm just going to make a new slide. I'm going to try to write out a few different points here that I think are I think are important. So one point here is that what are you trying to do? You're trying to say I want to make money, right? So when are you going to make money? If um, let's call these your predictions, right? If your predictions are correlated with future um, prices, right, uh, then you'll make money. And so we'll call this, um, or future returns. So we'll call this like returns in the future. So you'll, that's the condition that you want to satisfy um, if, uh, to make money. And I'm actually not gonna use P because P usually means prices. So we'll, we'll call this S, we'll call this model signal. And so when we went back to that, um, that diagram that I showed you and, uh, you know, look at different parts of this, your model predictions are coming out of here, right? And you need your model predictions to still be correlated kind of through all of this stuff with future, future prices. So what are some points at which that can break down? Um, and some points at which that can break down are the following. So let's say that your model predictions, your signal, um, let's check if it's correlated 
um, with uh, you know future returns in the past using a tool like Alpha Lens um, with historical returns. Um, so if it's correlated with historical returns in the past, that's a good sign. That's like the first check you have to do. And we're going to talk about that in Alpha Lens. OK, so let's say that your model survives that pass. Um, and that's really what you're doing when you're looking at um, refining your model uh, in this step, is you're exploring it and you're refining it. And you're saying, does my model just, you know, historically, in sample, does my model make predictions that are correlated with returns? And if that's true, then you say, OK, great. So then the next step is, is S um, dependent on other models? Because if S is dependent on other models, then S isn't really doing anything new. And so this is this notion of risk, right? Um, risk can express itself here. If S can be expressed as you know, two of the fama French factors, and it's like highly correlated with two of the fama French factors, then you're not really getting anything new out of S. So here's another point at which your process can fail, and you have to go back to the drawing board. So here are two points at which you can fail. Um, and then let's talk about the next point. So let's say that your model is historically correlated with future returns and historically uh, you know, uh, is independent of other models. Um, and so we'll actually say independent here. Uh, and then if it's independent of other models, then the next step is, OK, so let's use S to construct a portfolio. And when S constructs a portfolio, we need that portfolio to not be outside of our risk constraints. OK, so uh, S's portfolio is risk constraint. And the reason that's important is because let's say that you're constructing a portfolio and we'll again dig into all of these in a bit. Let's say that you're constructing a portfolio and then at the end of the day, you define that your portfolio just doesn't satisfy risk constraints. Like there's no way to make a portfolio. It's infeasible to construct a portfolio that won't satisfy that will satisfy the risk constraints that you need for your trading. And then the final one is that uh, the portfolio that you construct uh, after you trade it, after you go through execution, um, execution doesn't destroy S. So it's very possible that the cost of execution or the market impact of execution is just going to kind of destroy the signal. And one of the ways you can think about it is you start out with this kind of pristine signal that's correlated with um, returns and then you need to go through a few different kind of like noise additions before you get to the actual future prices because only when you've executed a trade can you access real market prices right like the way that you actually access real market prices and make money is post execution so you have to go through the process of risk constraining your model and executing your model and both of those are going to be kind of like noise sources that are going to reduce the correlation of s with future returns um, so let's talk about that a little bit more specifically now. Uh, and the way that I'm going to talk about that is actually going through a notebook that some of you may have seen. Um, but I think it's actually really useful and uh, important to just kind of re-go through this. Uh, so let's say that you have a model. Um, and let's say that you want to risk constrain your model. And this is important because all trading happens under some notion of risk constraints. Right. Everybody's risk constraints are different, but all trading happens under some notion of risk constraints. And so what do I mean by that? Well, your risk constraints can be anything. Your risk constraints can be um, your risk constraints can be uh, I don't want to be invested in oil because I'm, di you know, I'm divested. So that's a risk constraint. Your risk constraints can be I don't want to be over invested in a specific sector. I don't want to be um you know invested more dollars long than i am short i don't want to be like whatever your risk constraints are uh you can put them in there and then let's check how it will like affect your portfolio let's check how it will distort your alpha so the example i'm going to use is one that scott made in this notebook and it's on the forum so you guys can check it out uh if you go to the forums and you search optimize api and this is a post from a little while ago now uh, it's been updated recently with updates to the API, but this notebook still stands and is fairly useful. So um, the process here that we're going to talk about is the notion of kind of gradually adding constraints and seeing how, you know, uh, a model might survive those constraints. So in this case, uh, the example is, let's say that we construct, you know, a universe here of a few different symbols. Uh, 
And then we say, okay, uh, here are some expected returns uh, that you know, we have for these different symbols. And these are our model's expected returns. So again, this has no relation to real returns necessarily. <clears throat> this is just how our model thinks the world is going to turn out. And again, remember, come back to that perspective of you're making predictions, right? Your model is making predictions. So then you say, okay, uh, let's put, uh, a, you know, let's, let's naively optimize to maximize expected returns because that's all you can ever do is you can just maximize your expected return. So let's buy a portfolio, construct a portfolio that maximizes our expected returns. And that portfolio uh, looks like this one. We just put all of our, um, you know, all of our money into Twitter. And of course, this actually even has one constraint on it. And the constraint is that we have a maximum amount of money, a maximum exposure. So the maximum gross exposure, it just means that we have finite money. We can't borrow money indefinitely. If we expect that the returns of something should be positive, then naively, we would just put infinite money into that thing. Right. And so like the first risk constraint is that we are only going to invest up to a certain amount. Right. That's one risk constraint. This doesn't seem like a very good portfolio because it's really it's it's arrogant. It's saying that my model is good enough that it, you know, it knows exactly what's going to happen. And I'm going to put a 100 percent bet on this one thing, you know. So you then say, OK, so let's say nah, that's probably not very good. So now let's add um, some position concentration. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, position concentration says you can't be under or over invested in any one thing. So here we're going to say that we can't be more than 15% short any one thing and we can't be more than 30% long um, any one thing. Uh, and that's going to say, okay, now if I mean a new portfolio that satisfies these risk constraints. And of course, you don't have to really worry about what the optimizer is actually doing right now. You can imagine, I, I like to imagine as like some a uh, little like, you know, a uh, demon that runs off and does stuff for me. Um, and that's actually not too far from the truth. But um, basically what you're doing here is you're saying, uh, go find me a portfolio that maximizes my expected return while satisfying these constraints. So here's that portfolio, right? And that portfolio says, okay, well, you know, put some in Twitter, put some in McDonald's, put some short QSR because we think QSR is going to go down, put some in Apple. And this is like the maximal portfolio, assuming your expected returns are correct, which are these, um, subject to two risk constraints. And then we can keep going and we can keep adding constraints and adding constraints. Now we'll, um, you know, constrain sector exposure because here you can see we're totally overexposed to technology. Um, we just have, you know, a very, very, large bet in technology and we don't have anything in energy. So now we constrain our sector exposures to be within certain bounds. Um, and you'll notice that actually here we're going to be super aggressive. We're saying that we're actually have to be almost evenly invested in each sector uh, because sectors can go around and do weird stuff without people knowing. Now here's the new portfolio. And now we're getting to a point where like it's very hard to tell a story about this, right? You can't look at this portfolio and say, oh, I see why it's doing each thing that it's doing, right? Because there's this very complicated multivariate optimization process behind the scenes that's, um, you know, trying to maximize your expected return and it's trying to fiddle around with the weights to get them to within your constraints. So the 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 kind of consequence of this is that you're weights that you're going to actually be able to construct into a portfolio, your post-constraining portfolio weights. Um, and again, going back to that picture, your post-constraining uh, portfolio weights are not going to be the same as your model's predictions of the future because there's going to be constraining and they're not going to be the same. And so even if your model has a really strong prediction of what's going to happen with the future, it's very highly correlated. It can be the case that risk constraining just completely destroys your model. So they may not survive just the risk constraining step, right? And that's a point that I want to make here is that some models are just not risk, risk, you know, kind of aware. Some models are not constructed well to be able to survive risk. And it's not necessarily the model's fault or the author's fault. It's just some models just don't work well in the presence of risk constraints. Um, and, you know, you can keep constraining and constraining and constraining and, and uh, adding more constraints, removing constraints, and, and you'll end up with different portfolios. So that's a point that I wanted to make here is that I want to really dig into this notion of what does it mean to 
have model predictions and then have your model predictions kind of like fuzzies up, fuzzied up by, by risk constraints. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is like, how do you even check that your model in the first place uh, has any signal? So again, going back to this diagram, we've just been talking about this cell here, which is, okay, I think my model has predictive power. I think that my expected returns are correlated with future returns. And now I want to check to see whether or not, um, uh, you know, this thing can survive portfolio construction. But before then, remember, there's all of this stuff that we have to do, which is, does my model in the first place have any signal? So the way that we're going to actually check that is uh, using AlphaLens, which is an open source software that Quantopian developed. Um, and AlphaLens, um, the way that I always like, you know, go and clone a notebook to start doing stuff with it is actually from this lecture. So if you go to the lectures, it's uh, lecture 37, factor analysis. And lecture 37 um, is a full notebook that Max made uh, to uh, actually go over the full process of um, trying to think about like how do you evaluate an alpha factor? How do you evaluate whether or not a model has correlations with future returns, at least historically? Um, so I'm actually going to clone this. I don't think I'm going to mess around with it too much live because you know, this, pipe, this is pipeline and pipeline can take a little while to run. Um, but what I want to go through here is just this notion of checking for correlations between a model's returns and future returns. So here, uh, you know, again, just as a quick refresher, what we're going to do is we're going to first define our model. And this is a, a factor model. So it produces a prediction for every single thing in the universe every day. And the reason I think this is so powerful is because actually, Kind of any model can be in, 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 encoded like this because some models only make a prediction on a very narrow universe um, and some models make a prediction on a very large universe but like at the end of the day what a model is doing is it's making a prediction about a stock and the prediction can be uh the stock is going to go up uh, the prediction can be binary like that you know up or down the prediction can be continuous and that it has kind of like weights that it's going to assign to stocks but at the end of the day, you make money when that prediction is correlated with future returns. Like that's kind of the just inherent property that you want it to satisfy, right? If you have a prediction which is binary, um, you still want that binary number to be correlated with future returns uh, because if it's not, then you're not going to make money. Um, and so that's what Alpha Lens is really checking. So even if you have a model that works in a very narrow universe, you can just set the universe to be narrow and then that will work. Um, and, uh, you know, we set the universe in uh, this notebook um, specifically here. We just say screen equals universe. Um, and uh, you can set that universe to be, you know, whatever you want. Here we set it to be um, the Q1500 US, which I believe has actually since been uh, um, replaced by the Q tradable, um, which doesn't always have precisely 1500 stocks in it. But it's the same principle. Um, you could just set it to be, you know, your own 10 stocks if you wanted it to be. Um, but the question is really like, does this model predict the future? And so here, this is a very simple model. This is a momentum model. This says if things have kind of, you know, gone up in the past over the long term, we're going to anticipate that they will go up in the future, right? So it's a it's a simple model. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about the model. I'm kind of black boxing that out. What I want to talk about is some of the analyses that you're going to look at here. So um, I'm going to skip through a bunch of these and get to here. So what is this doing? This is saying, if you look at the model and you look historically, every day you look one day in the future, what is the correlation between my model's predictions on day T and the returns of all the assets on which it's making prediction on day T plus one? And then look at every day what that correlation is and um, or specifically just say like, you know, what the uh, what the return would be um, on a weighted portfolio. It's kind of a very similar concept. You can kind of go any way you want. Um, here, I'm actually going to look at uh, let's look at the information coefficient, because I think that's the most pure um, measure. Uh, that you can use in many cases. So the information coefficient is precisely just the, the correlation and the specific correlation you use is something called Spearman rank and there's a full lecture on that. But it's just the correlation between your model's predictions and the future returns, right? And you can do that for a correlation for, predict for returns that are one day in the future, the correlation for returns that are five days in the future, 10, 29, 300, whatever you want to do, you can set that. 
Um, but that's just what it's checking. It's saying what is if you take every day and you look at the correlation going forward and then average them all together or look at them as a time series, what does that look like? So for instance, here's them looking on a rolling basis. If you look at the correlation every day, and you want this thing to be consistently positive, but of course this is real data and that's never going to be the case, right? So you're never gonna have you know, perfect, perfect outcomes in which this thing is always predicting the future. Usually there's gonna be a lot of noise. Um, and uh, you know, so that's why we look at averages. And so here what we're looking at is the distribution of the uh, information coefficient over the time period that we're looking at. So this is a very important, powerful plot. This is looking at uh, the mean information coefficient over the sample you're looking at and the standard deviation. And obviously you want the mean to be high and the standard deviation to be low. Here, you know, these aren't super powerful information coefficients, you know. It looks like they do have some skew above zero, but it doesn't look like they have a huge amount of signal and it doesn't look like on average the correlation between your model's predictions and the future returns are that, you know, is that strong. It's, it's just, it's not a super, um, super powerful prediction. So, in general, this is kind of like some of how you're gonna check that first step of does my model's returns have um, the power to forecast the future, right? Does my model's uh, signal have the power to be correlated with future returns? And that's what Alpha Lens is all about checking. Alpha Lens is about checking, is that relationship true? And then once you've established that relationship, then the next question is, okay, now, does my model's returns, like are my model's returns independent of other models? Now, that's actually a functionality that Quantopian is like building into Alpha Lens. So hopefully that functionality will be in Alpha Lens soon, being able to do some risk analysis on a factor level. Um, if you do want to look in the meantime, one thing that I would recommend looking at um, is either the uh, capital asset pricing model notebook or the fundamental factor model notebook. I'm gonna look at this one for now. Um, and uh, specifically, what the notion is here is um, defining a few different factors uh, and then regressing the factors against each other or looking at a covariance of the factors, right? And then what that allows you to do is look at if you take these time series of factor returns, namely if you constructed a portfolio that was just naively weighted by this factor and didn't charge transaction costs or anything, just kind of a very pure portfolio, um, and then regress the returns of that portfolio against another portfolio, but a different model, how similar would those returns be? And if the two, arguably, if the two models are similar, you should see similar returns on a portfolio constructed by that model. And, you know, the intuition for that is pretty simple. It's just that if the models are producing similar predictions, the portfolios will be similar and therefore the returns will be similar. So this notion of looking at the covariance between the returns of multiple models is really important. And it really tells you kind of like, again, how much new stuff you're doing with this model that you developed with this idea. So again, relating it back to that kind of top level diagram, the area that we're talking about here is this compare to existing models area, right? Where you're saying, I have a model, I know what predictions that model is making, and I'm trying to see how similar are those predictions to another model or a set of other models that, I'm, that I care about. And sometimes those other models can be, you know, risk factors, and sometimes they can be other alpha factors that you want to trade. And, um, just to recap here, what have we done so far? We've said we've developed an economic hypothesis and that economic hypothesis for now, let's say it's the momentum factor, right? So we say we've developed an economic hypothesis. It's that stocks that go up uh, in the past are gonna continue going up in the future. Um, it's a very simple hypothesis and probably, you know, not super useful in the quant perspective. It's not necessarily like almost definitely something that's not gonna make that much alpha. Um, but then you say, okay, let's explore that model. And the way that we explored it is we used alpha lens. Um, and we used alpha lens to check, uh, does this model have any kind of correlation with returns in the past? And then once we did that, maybe we made some changes to the model. We said, oh, I noticed that it doesn't work really well here. It works better here, et cetera, et cetera. And then now that we've determined that yes, this model is useful for predicting the future, at least in some minor way, then the next step is let's compare it to other models that already exist because a very common pattern is you'll develop a supposedly new model, but then you'll just find out that it's actually not that different from other stuff. And like I said, 
This is something that we're trying to put into Alpha Lens, so you can actually do this check at the factor level as opposed to having to go all the way to an algorithm. Um, but I did want to talk about how you would actually do it right now, because right now you'd use the risk model and you'd use the risk model to say, you know, is a full strategy that I developed on this thing, um, you know, similar to other models and in, you know, is it similar enough that it's just not that useful. So, uh, like I said, you could have, you know, looked at a regression uh, between the returns of your model and other known models, or uh, you can use uh, kind of risk aware um, uh, techniques like the risk model to, to check that. So um, I'll just quickly point to this example, which is a post that I made in the community, community a little while ago. And what this does is this actually constructs a full algorithm. Um, and this full algorithm is going to trade on um, mean reversion. And uh, then what it's going to do is it's going to run the risk model on that algorithm. So here is the algorithm that I posted. Uh, you'll notice that it doesn't actually do all that much, um, but you can look at the source code and you can look at the model that's underlying it. And the model is just this mean version model. You can see here, um, it just says if the thing has you know, gone up especially high recently, better than it going down. And if the thing has gone down especially low recently, better than it going up. Um, it's a very simple mean reversion model, and we're going to apply it to the full stock market. And then we say, okay, let's look at the returns and the trades that this algorithm uh, makes, and let's see how different they are from other kind of known models. So this is looking at the risk similarity. So what we're curious about here is how similar is this model to other known risk models? And what we notice here is that, you know, it doesn't really have very much sector exposure, which is good because we, I believe, constrained out the sector exposure. Um, it doesn't have very much, um, you know, exposure to momentum. It doesn't have very much exposure to value, but it definitely has something here in short-term reversal. So short-term reversal is like a very simple form of, of mean reversion, which is just looking at, you know, things that have uh, gone up, especially in one direction or down, especially in one direction, reverting, reversing. Um, and you can see that every time we trade, the exposure of our portfolio to short-term reversals uh, just spikes, skyrockets, to the point that it's actually kind of just like, you know, uh, completely making bets on short-term reversal. So what this model is doing is no different from short-term reversal in many cases. And uh, as such, we would say, you know, this model not really very useful because it's already really explained by an existing model. So coming back to here, we say, you know, we've determined that the model maybe has some predictive power on returns, but then we go to compare it with the existing models and we say like, oh, okay, this thing doesn't really have you know, any difference from something like short-term reversal. Um, the other thing that you would want to do is compare it with existing alpha models that you are already trading, because, you know, if you're already trading five or six different models, you want to make sure that the new model you come up with is significantly different from the models that you're already trading, and that if you add it to the models that you're already trading, you're actually going to be getting, you know, a diversification benefit as opposed to a concentration risk. Um, and that's where the model weighting comes from. That's where you say, okay, if I'm trading six models and I came up with a new one, um, you know, how much weight should I give to each of my existing models? How much weight should I give to the new one? How should I average the predictions together um, in order to, uh, you know, make an intelligent portfolio? Um, and then when you've done all of that, again, out of sample testing, you always have to out of sample test everything. That's just like, that should be second nature. I shouldn't have to say it. Um, you know, you've determined that this is a new model. You've determined an intelligent weighting. Out of sample test it. Um, and then, you know, once you've determined that your model is independent of other things that already exist, it's correlated with future returns, you've figured out an intelligent way to weight your model against other existing models that you have or are using to trade, um, then, and you have sample tested it and it seems to still work well, then the next step is, okay, how do I actually construct a portfolio based on this model, right? And the way that you're gonna do that is, um, using you know, risk-aware portfolio optimization. So I, I went through that very simple example in this notebook where you're talking about how am I constructing a portfolio that satisfies various risk constraints while also trying to maximize expected return. Well, this is just a slightly more complicated version of that. We have a full lecture on it now on risk-constrained portfolio optimization. And uh, the general idea is that we want to take a portfolio that maximizes our return, assuming that our model's predictions are correct, that is also subject to risk constraints. Um, and 
you know, this is, I think, a, a good lecture that goes through a lot of specific examples on here and actually talks about breaking down um, how we think about the exposures of each stock and how we build up the risk, risk exposures of a specific portfolio and how we compute the risk exposures of a specific portfolio and then how we say whether or not a specific portfolio may be you know, over risk or under risk in any specific um, constraint. So this lecture I think is really good to go through if you want more information about that. But again, um, the Quantopian API makes it, uh, you know, we're gonna release a lot more tutorials and examples and, and uh, you know, template lectures for how you can start constraining your risk in various different ways. But the general idea um, I'll show you if you go to, again, the lectures, I hang out at the lectures a lot. Um, but if you look at the example, uh, uh, long short equity algorithm, which should be in here somewhere, right here. Um, you can see here that this algorithm at the bottom here, when it actually does the ordering, actually just defines a set of constraints, right? So it says its objective function is maximizing alpha, and the alpha vector is just your model's prediction. So it's just going to try to maximize you, this is really effectively expected returns. Like you can kind of almost, you can almost exchange, I don't precisely exchange, but you can almost exchange the notion of alpha and expected returns. You're trying to maximize the alpha that your model is capturing and the alpha is captured precisely in the output of your model, your signal. So you're trying to maximize your, your model signal. It's no different from here. Um, the maximize alpha is, is, is no different from your saying, you know, I have, this set of predictions, this vector of alphas of, you know, where I think stocks are going to go, how much alpha each stock has. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to maximize that, that weighted sum. And then you just define a constraint. So, you know, I only am going to put so much money into this. Uh, it needs to be dollar neutral. So I can't invest more dollars short and long than long. Um, I can't invest more dollars long than short. It has to be equal. Uh, sector exposures have to be equal, so you can't be overinvested in any sector. This is kind of something that's very hard to achieve unless you're trading a lot of names. Just be aware. Again, like, you know, if you're trading a small number of names, it can be very hard to get to sector neutrality without totally destroying your, your alpha. And again, remember that notion of, of correlation. Your model's predictions to work have to be correlated with future prices, future returns. And every time you constrain them, you're going to make it harder to get precise, you know, you're gonna you're gonna weaken that correlation. You're gonna make it harder to find a portfolio that is faithful to your model's weights. You know, you're gonna move further and further away from your optimal weights. So, uh, just be aware that every time you put a constraint in there, depending on the notion of what's going on in your alpha, you may just completely get rid of your alpha, and then you have to make an intelligent decision. Is it the risk constraint that needs to go? Is it that you know the risk constraint is probably too too restrictive? Or is it that your model is not, you know, is is not good in a risk constrained world, and that you just you can't actually use it? Um, both of those are totally feasible options. Um, but usually, I think it's that your model is not good in a risk constrained world, uh, in my experience. Um, and then we can also put in extra factors. So um, we're going to be introducing more factors in here. So you can also be risk constrained to the uh, factors that occur in the risk model. Um, we, you know, we're going to try to make it so you can just be risk constrained uh, to style factors and, and just have a portfolio that is, you know, totally aware. And again, you can set the constraints. So you can say, I'm okay taking up to a 30% exposure to momentum. I'm okay taking up to blank. And you can actually, you know, update those on the fly. So you can imagine a portfolio that would actually adjust its risk constraints as it's going. You can say that right now, I'm okay taking, a, you know, a larger bet on momentum. Later, I'm okay taking a larger bet on volatility. You know, you can have something that's intelligent. Um, it doesn't have to be completely uh, constrained all the time. Uh, for allocation from Quantopian, um, we're working to provide clearer guidelines around exactly what, you know, the risk constraints uh, that we are going to require for an allocation have to be. Um, but in the meantime, just get comfortable with this notion of constraining based on risk and uh, this notion of, you know, how far can you constrain your portfolio before you lose all the alpha that's in it. Um, so this is the actual API by which you constrain, and we're just going to add more uh, factors to here so you can constrain on more factors. Um, but, uh, you know, the principle behind it is going to stay almost exactly the same. And again, to tie back to this kind of um, overall drawing, now we're in this stage where we're, you know, constructing a portfolio that's risk aware. And then we are, um, 
going to back test it. We're going to check to see if it actually uh, can survive, you know, because it could be that it's it, it could be that it's a great model that predicts the future. It could be that it's actually you can constrain it by a risks and it still produces good signals. But then it turns out that for whatever reason, you just can't trade it. Maybe it's trading names that are too illiquid, you know, and you can't get in and out. Maybe it's trading names that are going to be too expensive to trade. So the trading costs just eat up all your returns, right? There's many failure cases that can um, can break things here. Um, but then again, after you've determined that, you know, this thing survives risk constraints, it's, it's, uh, it survives market impact, then the next step would just be to, you know, keep running it for uh, an out of sample type uh, period on the real market, ideally with, you know, paper trading or a very small amount of capital and, and, and just, you know, wait and make sure it keeps working and then, and then scale it up. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I just wanted to kind of, again, go over that full, full workflow. So to recap here, before I take some questions, the first thing we do is we can, we come up with an idea and where do ideas come from? Um, ideas can come from your understanding of the world. They can come from data. They can come from whatever, but oftentimes they come from when your understanding of the world doesn't match what's going on. Those are where new insights come from. When you have an implicit model or understanding of the world and you find an area where the world disagrees with that model, that is usually where there's an opportunity to improve your understanding of the world and come up with a new and better model. And then once you've tested that model and make sure that that model is, you know, produces bets, produces predictions that are correlated with the future outcomes, then, you know, refine the model a little bit, then, um, and again, this is a uh, functionality that we're currently building into AlphaLens, you compare it to existing models. You say, is the model really producing something new or is it just, you know, a rehash of things that have already been done? And based on that, you know, level of new material, you determine a model weighting between your model and all the other models that you might be using to trade. Uh, and then you can see like, you know, in this example algorithm, for instance, um, we're only using one model, but you know, you might imagine just taking another model, pasting it in, and then literally just, you know, adding in a new factor to this combined rank score. This combined rank score is actually the alpha, you know, vector that we're using to make predictions. Um, and uh, actually in here, it defines two additional factors, value and quality, and then, you know, averages them together with combined rank. But you might say, well, I actually want to put a lot more momentum on, a lot more weight on momentum or a lot more weight in quality or, you know, whatever you've determined to be the most intelligent based on your alpha lens analysis. Um, but then once you've done that and you've determined that I have this really good combination of models, then the next step is out a sample test and then construct a portfolio. And so again, I recommend that everybody, um, go through and they look at this risk constrained optimization lecture because I think it will be very helpful in understanding what's actually going on when you're constraining risks and and you know looking at what the portfolio risks might be at the end of the day with a risk model run and understanding you know where your risk risks are coming from um, and then once you've done that and back tested it and made sure that your portfolio is constructed well and it's risk aware and things are going right then you know you're you're all set to try to maybe paper trade this and 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 move forward but um, hopefully we're going to have more materials and webinars and everything on all these individual parts and all these individual, um, you know, kind of nitpicky things that you can get stuck on in here. But I just wanted to step back and really kind of talk about from a high level, all the different components and, you know, really what the broad process is of coming up with an idea and then taking all the steps to ensure that this idea survives all the way out to, you know, being able to live trade and, 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 and make money. Um, so that's all I specifically had to, to, to run through today. And I know that it was a lot and usually I take questions during, so I apologize for not taking questions during, um, today, but I think I have some time to take questions now. Yeah, so. Okay. So I have some questions here, uh, already. So one question is, um, I use the foundation, um, the, the basically it's asking, um, whether or not the assumption that historical prices contains all the information to beat the market is, is valid. And, and it says, don't you more information sources, only pricing data, news, quarterly analysis, market sentiments. Absolutely. That like it, that you're, you're completely right. Um, pricing data alone is almost never going to give you enough information these days. Um, pricing data is like almost thoroughly arbitraged away. I think in, in many cases, there's really nothing, you know, most quants believe there's kind of nothing new to be found there. Um, everybody has it. Everybody's constantly looking at it. So 
pricing data itself is not where your new ideas are going to come from. Your new ideas are going to come from alternative insights. Your new ideas are going to come from, you know, uh, this. You've noticed that companies that uh, file their two the, the, want some type of report late you, are usually in some kind of financial trouble, and so you can just look at the the filing date and whether or not the filing date was on time, or you know, like there's things like that are really that's where your new ideas are going to come from. So you're you're totally right. Um, just using pricing data is is not a good way to do this. And I think the examples that I referred to here generally use pricing and fundamentals data just because it's easy and it's fast. But you're right. You inject into to come up with real ideas that produce alpha. You want to use alternative data. Um, so. The next question is, you know, what existing models should we factor out? Like, what are the set? Well, the answer is really, again, it's completely relative. So there's, you know, risk models that are made available. Quantopian makes available a risk model. Other companies make available risk models. And at the end of the day, um, it's really about like, you know, what is considered cheap beta that is easy to buy and what is actually interesting alpha. So basically anything in a risk model is going to be considered cheap beta. Um, because it's easy to purchase and like everybody knows about it. Uh, and so if it's in a risk model, by and large, it's probably not alpha. And you should probably, you know, factor that as, you know, something that you, you should, you do not want to be dependent on. You do not want your returns to be associated with that model, uh, the returns of that model. Um, but if it's not in a risk model and it's not something that you're already trading, like if it's, you know, if, if the returns of your new model are not, you know, correlated with anything from a known risk model, and they're not correlated with um, stuff you're already trading. And when I say not correlated, it's actually not the right phrasing. What I should say is, do, does something new, you know, without having this massive structural risk built in? Because sometimes you can do a model which is 30% new stuff and 70% existing stuff. And as long as you can kind of like hedge out or filter out the existing stuff without destroying the new stuff, that's good because you can average it all together and it will kind of actually be an independent new information. Um, there's another question uh, asking about uh, out of sample testing. Um, so is random k-fold testing? So this question is asking about cross-validation, which is um, a, a methodology for trying to uh, reduce overfitting, which is when you um, kind of randomly select a portion of your in-sample data and then test your model on that as out of sample. Um, I would say that it is a weaker form of out of sample testing. Um, and I would say it's probably not good enough. Generally, out of sample testing on new data is just completely new data is the only gold standard that many people um, refer to. Uh, and, you know, it's especially difficult in finance where there's so much covariance between assets. It's hard to know when you're doing a K-fold cross-validation just how much independence you're gathering between your samples. I will say cross-validation is an amazing tactic because in sample, during in sample analysis, it can help you avoid overfitting and make it more likely that when you get to out of sample testing, you will be successful. Um, but I wouldn't rely on it solely for, um, you know, validation that your model works. That said, of course, you know, it's very context dependent. And if you find that it's consistently working for you, great. It's just in general, I don't have enough evidence that uh, cross-validation is really going to be sufficient compared to um, true out-of-sample testing. Um, so another question is, uh, you know, what would, what would an acceptable way to be to predict future returns? Um, well, uh, the answer to that question is, if I knew, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, that's kind of the fundamental question in quant finance, is like, what models can you come up with uh, that you know, predict future returns? That is the question in, in alpha generation. Like, that's it. That If you can answer that question, you're good to go. Um, and, and, and that's really kind of like the main task on Quantopian right now that Quantopian asks its users to do is come up with a model that uses data in some way to predict future returns, right? And like um, the first question asked, and like I, I, I said, you know, oftentimes that model or almost always that model is not solely going to use prices. It may use prices as one factor, but uh, certainly it's going to be basing its core predictions on other data sets. You know, it's going to be coming up with a really interesting new insight um, based on other data. So I think that, you know, ways to get ideas for this are to read academic papers, to read the forums on Quantopian, to talk to other people. But at the end of the day, you really have to have some insight what data set can I use to predict the future? And, you know, like, 
you know, why is what I'm doing different from what people have done before? That's kind of the question you really have to ask yourself. Why is it that this is an arbitrage opportunity, you know, and, and almost kind of always should your default assumption, should your prior be that what you're going to do is not going to work just because so many things, like the process of data science is not easy. The process of developing models is not easy. You know, kind of most things you do fail and then occasionally you stumble on something that works. And that's really when you're, um, you know, going to make progress. But it, it's it's definitely not the case. You just everything you're going to try is going to work. It's it's it, it's research. It's science. This stuff, most stuff is is going to fail. Um, and uh, so another another question was asking um, if I could elaborate a bit on how do you compare a new model against existing models. Uh, so that's a good question. And again, I I, I urge you to refer to um, specifically. Uh, the lecture on fundamental factor models and the lecture on um, uh, capital uh, capital markets and, and arbitrage pricing theory. Um, uh, this one here, 29 uh, and then 31. And uh, I don't have time to go deeper into the math today, uh, but uh, those lectures really do go into it. And the short answer is, that you look at the returns on a portfolio, no transaction cost, just kind of a very simple portfolio that's been weighted by your factor and then rebalanced according to some rebalancing period rule. Usually it's like a day or a month or whatever the factor is that makes sense. It's really like how often are you gonna rebalance your model? And then you say, uh, you know, are my returns similar? Do they have high dependency in a linear regression? Um, with uh, you know my uh, existing models that I want to compare them against. So that's usually how you'll do it. You'll take your new model, you'll take your five existing models, and you'll run a re linear regression with your model's portfolio weighted returns as the uh, Y variable. And then as the independence, you'll have the portfolio weighted returns of all your existing models. Um, and then you want to look for how much dependency there exists in that uh, in that linear regression. And the more dependency, the more that the, you know, existing models are similar to and explain the performance of your new model. And the more alpha there is, the more unexplained returns, the more your new model is producing alpha. That's just really where the notion of alpha comes from is you look at the linear regression between your model and existing models and the existing models can be alpha models or risk models. Um, but at the end of the day, the alpha that's remaining when you try to explain what's going on with existing models is alpha. That is alpha is just, you know, residual returns. Um, so another question here is, uh, um, whether I consider an approach where um, we don't uh, restrict the strategy too strictly and leave um, risk management, got it. So this is basically saying like, this question is asking if, you know, a risk management approach is adding together a ton of models and kind of letting them, um, letting them risk manage out in the wash. And the answer is absolutely. That is a great approach. And that's effectively what you're doing with your different models, right? So you generally don't really, you know, want your models to be super risk constrained on their own, but you're hoping that you can combine models in such a way that the outcome prediction is not going to be super risk heavy. And so the way to think about it is again, it's, it's, it's very philosophical. So, um, like I said, now that we have the risk model out, um, Quantopian is working on providing, you know, uh, clear guidance on precisely what the risk tolerance is we're going to be looking for in the, uh, uh, you know, algorithms. And I think if you want more information, you can also go check out the um, post in the forums that's announcing the uh, new uh, contest format. Um, and I'll just pull that up quickly so that people can uh, take a look. Um, but uh, I recommend checking that out um, because uh, I think it'll, huh, can't even, oh, here it is. Uh, I think it'll help, you know, it's, it's, it's not precisely what we're, I don't want to say it's precisely what we're looking for yet, but it's definitely going to give you some hints about where we're going. Um, but uh, there's different philosophies, right? Some philosophies are that you want to constrain every single component to be, um, you know, super risk controlled and have no risk. And then the other philosophy is that you want to take many, you know, risky components and average them together and diversify out the risk. Both of those are totally valid. And 
Um, you know, I think most real world approaches land somewhere in the middle. And it's just, you have to kind of intelligently look at your system and say, which approach is going to work for me based on, you know, what I have and how I invest capital and how many strategies I have access to, et cetera. You know, do you want to do the diversification at the algorithm level or the model level and, 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 and what makes sense and what works? And, you know, if you have one model that trades asset equities and one model that trades futures, you don't want to average those models together. That makes no sense. They're making predictions on different universes. Uh, but if you have multiple models that trade equities, maybe you want to average them together. Or maybe you find that when you average them together, you actually lose all of the signal, right? It's, it's, it's context dependent. You have to intelligently go in there um, and understand. And, 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 and remember, the end goal is getting to a final like aggregate level portfolio that is risk constrained, not that, you know, at every single little minute uh, model that you have to have risk constrained uh, behavior. Um, so uh, another question is asking, what's the difference um, for the two different backtest stages? And, and what is my opinion when it's, you know, ready to move on to the next stage? So I don't, I, here for me, this is kind of the main backtest stage, right? Because in this stage, you're not really backtesting. You're really designing a portfolio and you're deciding on execution rules. Um, so maybe I misunderstood the question, but uh, here you're not backtesting yet. You're really just saying, how am I going to backtest, right? Like, what is my portfolio? What is my execution rules? And then you're actually doing the backtesting here. And what you're backtesting for is you're backtesting to make sure, again, Model predictions are correlated with future prices. There's a bunch of things that can get in the way with that. Like, are they correlated with prices historically? Um, how do they compare with existing models? Uh, can you construct a portfolio that is risk constrained that still can get at your model predictions without you know, corrupting them too much? Um, is your execution design, does it trade too much? Can you construct an execution a scheme that will be okay given your model predictions? And then once you do all of that and you back test it, do you still um, you know, make money. Uh, and that's really what backtesting is checking. Is it saying like, are you resilient to real market, real frictions, you know, uh, stuff that goes on. So, and what I will say about like, when is it ready to move to the next stage? Well, I would honestly say just like, again, everything is relative. Um, if you don't have any other strategies, but you've constructed a risk constrained portfolio that makes money, again, it's all relative. You're ready to move to the next stage when you're backtest can consistently, and you have enough evidence to convince yourself this is true, be a better investment opportunity for you than alternatives. Maybe your alternative is that you would invest in the US market, in the broad market, in the SPY or something, right? And to so for this back test to be a preferable alternative, maybe you say, well, look, this thing doesn't return too much, but it's pretty low risk, and I can put 5% of my money in it, and it's a diversification benefit. Great. Again, it's all, it's portfolio theory all the way down. And uh, you just want to be intelligent and um, aware of, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, this thing is going to be better than an alternative. So I'd say like, the answer to your question is when is it good to move on to the next stage of paper trading it is like, you know, when it's good enough that it's better than an alternative for you. Um, so uh, another question is, um, do models that use like uh, kind of bizarre correlations um, uh, actually work uh, or are they more folklore? And, and, and I would say in general, a lot of the types of models that you'll read about on, you know, like charting forums or that kind of stuff, um, in general, a lot of them really boil down to when you do the risk analysis, boil down to other uh models so like they just turn out to be almost identically mean reversion or almost identically momentum um and the actual value add is very low um so what i would say is like i would say don't think about um those you know models as much as you know like uh you know new things as much as they are just kind of rehashed um other known market effects and really kind of be rigorous about saying like do these models follow something new or are they just following existing models? And, and, and that's the question you want to be asking yourself. And I think that we're out of time for today. So um, I'll let Paige give any kind of final notes or anything like that. We also just wanted to let everyone know that our next webinar will be called Seeking Alpha and Alternative Data with Anthony Ng. And that will be next Thursday, December 14th at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so we just wanted to thank everyone for joining and have a nice day. Thank you.